Okay, good afternoon. Um, my name is Nader Hashimi. I'm the director of the Center for Middle East Studies, and I'd like to begin by thanking all of the other co-sponsors for today's event, the Center for China-U.S. Cooperation, the Crossley Center for Public Opinion Research, the Latin America Center, and the Sea Center. Um, every year, our Center for Middle East Studies begins the academic year with an event um, uh, focusing on some aspect of the politics of the Middle East as a way of welcoming new students and announcing our upcoming programming. But of course, this year is a different year because there's a new occupant in the White House, and his name is Donald J. Trump. Need I say any more? Uh, regional issues, in many ways, are much less important than what's happening here in the United States under the presidency of Donald Trump, and given the size, the influence, and the position of the United States in the global system, focusing on the United States during this moment of crisis makes perfect sense as an inaugural event. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, students, faculty members, friends of DU and the Joseph Corbell School, this is how democracy declines. We have all had a front row seat for the past eight months. It's been, been unfolding before our eyes. And in my view, the roots of the decline of democracy in the United States far precede the 2016 presidential election. I hope we can perhaps address that aspect of this topic today in our discussions and our debate. Um, we're gathered here today at a very critical and ominous moment in US history and world history to try and make sense of this enormous political crisis that envelops uh, this country. We seek to diagnose it, to interpret it, to understand it, and since we're also a school of international studies, to analyze and assess its global effects. Several questions emerge. What are the roots of the contemporary crisis affecting or afflicting American democracy? Are they to be located in economic issues or in racial issues or in some combination thereof? To what extent is Donald Trump himself the problem or is he really a symbol of a deeper malaise affecting the American body politic? To what extent is the contemporary crisis of democracy in the USA unique when compared on a global scale? In other words, how does the rise of right-wing populism in the USA differ from right-wing populism in other electoral democracies, Poland, Hungary, Germany, Russia, Turkey, India, Israel, the Philippines, Africa, Latin America. Precisely how are these different regions of the world being affected by the election of Donald Trump and his new foreign policy agenda to the extent that we can decipher a coherent foreign policy agenda? To what extent do previous theories and paradigms of politics help us understand this deep moment of crisis, both, dom both dom domestically and internationally? In other words, to what extent do we need to adjust our analytical and interpretive lenses to make sense of this moment of crisis? And finally, what are the lessons of history that bear on this particular moment and that shed light on this topic? Or conversely, are we in a completely new uh, moment of uncharted political waters without historical precedent. I think these are a few of the questions that bear on today's event. I've asked our panel to uh, prepare 10 minutes of opening uh, remarks on the title of today's event, uh, Donald Trump, the Crisis of U.S. Democracy, Implications for Global Affairs. After their initial presentations, we will have time for questions and interventions from the floor. And as the moderator, I reserve the right to oppose my own questions to the panel to advance the discussion in the interest of time, I'm not going to give our panel an extensive, um, detailed introduction. Uh, this is very much an in-house event, and if you wanted to find out more about the biography of our um, distinguished panel, uh, you can look it up. Jack Donnelly teaches international relations, comparative analysis of historical international systems, the theory and practice of human rights. He's also a key part of our political theory initiative here at Corbell. Eileen Grabel is a professor of international economics. Her research focuses on the political economy of international finance, the political economy of financial reform in developing countries, financial crises, international private capital flows, and she's also the co-director of our MA program in global finance, trade, and economic integration. Michelini Shai teaches human rights, political theory, comparative politics, history, and methodology, the politics of the Middle East. She's also the co-director of our political theory initiative here at the Corbell School. And last, but certainly not least, Aaron Schneider is the Leo Bloch Chair of International Studies, co-director of the Latin American Center and co-director of our International Development Program. And his research focuses on the intersection of wealth and power in the developing world with an emphasis on questions of uh, public finance. Um, Jack Donnelly, the floor is yours for the next 10 minutes. 
Thanks, Nader. Um, in terms of what Nader had to say, what I want to do is not talk about the roots so much of the problems with democracy. And I don't want to talk about Donald Trump. It's just too easy to stand up here and trash Trump for his idiocy and his authoritarian leanings. But to talk about a structural feature of the American electoral system that actually transmits whatever root problems there may be and has helped to produce both the president and the Congress that we have now. And that is the American electoral system, which has at least three peculiarities that are deeply anti-democratic. The first of which is the Electoral College. All right? The Electoral College, as we all know, gives every state two uh, votes for, its, for being a state, and then the number of members of the House of Representatives that they have. Seats in the House of Representatives are reasonably well distributed by population, but of course, the other two votes that go for the senators don't. This leads to a very bizarre situation. We look at the four smallest states, Wyoming, uh, Vermont, Alaska, and North Dakota. They have an average population of 671,000, which means that there are 224,000 people per electoral vote in the smallest states. In the four largest states, California, Texas, Florida, and New York, the average population is 225 million, which means 590,000 per electoral vote. In other words, if you live in one of the four smaller states, your vote counts more than twice as much for president than if you live in the four largest states. And if we were to really go crazy and compare Wyoming, where it's less than 200,000 per electoral vote, with California, where it's more than 700,000, more than three times as much. Now, if population size were distributed in such a way that it was not correlated with party, this would mean nothing, but in fact, it is correlated with party, and that helps to explain why twice in the last 2004, eight, well, five elections, right, we've had presidents that were, that did not win the popular vote, all right? Now, this is intentional, right? The system was intended to be non-democratic, it still is. The intent is quite different, all right? It was intended to protect state rights, states' rights in a particular kind of way, especially the rights of those states that got three-fifths of their uh, slave population added to their apportionment, all right? But clearly what we have is something that was intended to be non-democratic, is deeply non-democratic, and in two of the last five elections have produced a president that did not win the popular vote. So there's a structural problem here. <laughs> right? The problem also exists in the House of Representatives. If we look at the last election, uh, take all the votes for representatives. Republicans got a bit over 63 million, and Democrats got a bit under 62 million. In other words, 50.6% of the votes cast for those in the House went to Republicans, and 49.4% went to Democrats. However, when we look at the seats, 55.4% went to Republicans, and 44.6% went to Democrats. So basically, there's, a five, there's close to a 5% overrepresentation of Republicans, and close to a 5% underrepresentation of Democrats. Now, part of that is size. All right. But it's not all size. We know that a large part of it is gerrymandering. All right. And if you look at the data, it turns out that Republican states aren't all that much more gerrymandered than Democratic states, particularly when you look in the middle um, where there's the greatest variation. But there are more Republican states, and not surprisingly, we get this kind of result. So we have another structural problem, all right, that not only is the president elected in a 
non-democratic way, and of course, the Senate in an intentionally non-democratic way, in which you know it's bad enough that uh, the average citizen in Wyoming has three times the uh, weight, but in the Senate, all right, California and Wyoming each have the same representation. Intentionally non-democratic, and the House in practice turns out to be fundamentally non-democratic. So there are 241 Republicans, 194 Democrats, that's counting anybody who, uh, counting who caucuses with whom if we've got uh, people who are supposedly independent, which means that if we had distributed the results on the basis of the percentage of election, the difference would be 220 to 215. And we would be talking about a fundamentally different House of Representatives. All right, add to that systematic voter suppression, which in this group I'll just simply assert exists and assume that we don't have to argue about the deepness of the conviction of uh, folks in the North Carolina legislature to protect uh, the voter rights from non-existent fraud. So what you have is a very deep structural problem. An electoral system that is intentionally non-democratic, is unintentionally non-democratic, and is actively non-democratic, particularly with respect to Republican-controlled uh, seats. So what we have is a system that is functionally intended to produce the result that we have now, and Donald Trump is simply a symptom, Paul Ryan is simply a symptom, Mitch McConnell is simply a symptom, and unless we address this structural element, whatever the other root causes may be, this is the mechanism by whatever root causes are out there gets translated into national government, and that seems to me the heart of the problem. Thanks. Jack, why am I not surprised that you are focusing on structural issues when you talk about... So I'm going to go to the, I'm going to, my remarks would be limited to three points. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the conditions that led to the crisis of democracy. Um, what are the usual, usual populist strategies, democratic, domestically and internationally, that, oh no, that's my, can you take care of this? <laughs> it's happening more than once. Domestic and international, what are those populist strategies on the domestic and international levels that most populist leaders follow? And last point I would like to focus upon is just maybe is there anything we can do? There's not much time to focus on that point, but maybe we can um, address it in the Q&A. So the conditions that created the crisis of democracy are numerous. Historically, we can say that the populism tend to emerge as a result of economic crisis, the fragmentations of civil society, um, and then the crisis of political legitimacy. If you add to this the fact that interna the international order is in disarray, or the international financial structure is also in disarray, we see suddenly the sprouting or the contagions of those populist movement, not just in the United States, but in other places such as in Western Europe. Um, what is interesting, however, is that we saw a significant economic recovery under the Obama administrations, but nonetheless, many really felt marginalized and uh, felt that their lot has not been changed and was not improved whatsoever. And uh, there were quite a long list of those groups. White male workers, certainly from the Rust Belt, had lost their job, not only through the Mexican markets, but also through the Asian market, and in order to add insult to injury, uh, they have, their work had been replaced often by the machines, uh, robots, and so forth. We know that in those, that those areas, there is a high level of suicide rate, uh, opiate addiction, and absolutely a very rare or not sufficient medical coverage. So this is a real problem that has been below the radars of many of our politicians. There is still and remain today um, a high number of African-American who are still in prison, male African-American who are still in, in prisons, 
perhaps above 30% of that population, which counts really more than um, other countries in the world, uh, Argentina, Canada, Lebanon, German, uh, Germany, Finland, England, and India, which is really a big country. So we are actually above in terms of total uh, prison populations with respect to this country. Um, last, and a group that actually has also felt very marginalized and disenchanted is the women's, women's uh, generally speaking. Although their educations have risen, many have earned college degrees, there is still among many of them the sense that if they earn entry jobs, they still have the famous glass ceiling. But not just for those upper, middle, upper class uh, uh, women is uh, the problem. We, they still feel that uh, in comparison to their Western counterparts, they do not benefit from socialized childcare, making often for women a difficult dilemma to de choose either between their career or their um, or family. So that has created, to some extent, a brewing social discontent that has been captured, that has not been initially captured either by the Democratic Party or by the Republican Party, which remain extremely divided. And that political crisis has left a political void, a void that has been replaced and filled by the rise of populist leader, leader and with Trump, a, a real leader with a reactionary agenda. Now, we need to know, and that I'm getting to my second point, we need to know that the almanac of right-wing populist leaders, um, and, and that includes that of Trump, remained somewhat contradictory. In fact, it appeals to two opposite force. On the one hand, populist leaders attempt to bring people together, sort of the broader social discontent and marginalized people wants to unify them under one specific umbrella, such as make America great. But on the other hand, populist uh, leaders tend to also be extremely divisive because they are trying to purge the social contract, the American social contract, by creating just sort of a smaller group of people who will be the benefactors of the welfare system. So we see those two opposite force in, in, um, in operation. Uh, if I were to be Machiavelli and I had to instruct Trump to remain in power, you will tell me this is not my job as a human rights professor, but should I do that, I will actually find out that he's really following my instructions a la lettre, really very closely. What he does first and foremost is that he purified your base, demonized foreign migrants, black workers and successful women, and blame those who have historically been identified as profiteer. The notion of a Jewish conspiracy of bankers have been very much out there for historically and has been reclaimed by his grassroots. Second, I would tell him, and he's doing it, so he's not listening to me, he listened to Bannon, I will tell him, attack the defenders of human rights, the, the defenders of marginalized people, liberal and leftist intellectual. And you know why you should attack them? Because they are not patriotic. They favor instead foreigners, the environment, and immorality, and the expense to their own tribe, their own compatriot. They are just simply cosmopolitan elitists who do not care about their own. That's the second point. The third point, I will tell him, and he's doing it, again, deflect discontent by challenging all rule. That is to say, all possible rule. Civility, constitutional, scientific rule, you name it, just do that. Um, your follower, and here I have just a wonderful quote from Hannah Arendt in The Origins of Totalitarianism, in which it suggests that those followers, when she talk about the characteristic of the totalitarian leaders, will not desert you if you lied. In fact, they will protest that they had known all along that your statement will, was a lie, and they will admire you for your superior tactical cleverness. So it doesn't really matter. They will still think you're smart. Just keep doing this and deflect, and deflect the problem elsewhere. Um, fourth, I will certainly try to suggest that strength is always more revered than democratic cooperation, which is always understood as the most contemptible form of leadership, that if anything, try to uh, keep people in fear rather than love, to repeat Machiavelli's instructions to the prince. Fifth, and that's probably a little bit of a twist to, to the prince here, um, court two opposite front. Um, first, the entrepreneurial class, the entrepreneurial class because they create jobs, but you will also have to support or keep the support of the mass that has elected you um, 
And so how do you do that? You will have to strike a vertical alliance, an alliance between the anti-established elite and the mob. And that has really has been created under Trump administration. But since you have to be reminded, if Bannon was talking to Trump, He's no longer, but he's still talking to her. You'll have to remember that the mass is erratic, impatient, and so you will do that by creating deflection, focusing the attention on the evil foreign forces among us and beyond us. And six, uh, if there are internal social contradiction, and there will be social internal social contradiction, make sure that you point to threatening external problem, and if they're really threat out there, and there are real threats out there, we know all that, just amplify them, make the problem of North Korea bigger than it is, I mean it is, make it bigger, Iran it is, but make it much, much bigger, the Islamic terrorists make it bigger, it exists, so just make sure that you do that. It's, uh, you would think that Trump is a student of mine, but he's not, so <laughs> now, uh, if I were to just be provided with a couple of statements about what we could do, and I don't know, in light of history, only in two minutes, so I'll do that in two minutes. How can we defeat populism today? A couple of things I would like to just suggest, and maybe we can pick it up later on. Na nationalism is really a way of thinking that is, is postured against the, the, against the world. The world is hostile, so the world is out, out to get us, to take our job. So we need to erect walls. We need to make sure that we are protected because they're going to go after us. Now, there are the way of thinking that is called internationalism that are not as national economic protectionist or isolationist, and those old form of internationalism could be reclaimed. How would they look today? In one minute. So, if I had to recast a little bit the debate, what I would suggest is not that we look just outside, sort of like we are part of the world, but we lose everything that is from inside. The center is falling, I don't remember, <laughs> something of that sort. What we would need to do, perhaps, and in, in an effort to recast the debate, is to actually suggest, even in a utilitarian term, how the outside world, the external world, actually can benefit us, such as how can international trade, better fair trade, uh, help creating robust jobs at home? How environmental uh, treaties can help better create jobs at home? Uh, why an immigrant force is so important for the United States and the American contract? Why is health organization so important? Because they actually provide the possibility to stop an epidemic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So recasting the debate, trying to see how we can actually not, we are not just sort of uh, trying to defend ourselves from a world outside that is here to take everything that we have, but rather that we also uh, uh, um, benefit from it and that they benefit from us. I think that this is the type of agenda with very practical um, um, uh, proposal that needs to be developed. Thank you. Thanks to Nada and Gina and everyone uh, for being a part of this session. Um, I, I, I would like to talk about the implications of the Trump administration for uh, the world economy and toward global economic governance. And this reflects my own interests and my own area of expertise. Um, and I know, of course, the story is a very depressing story in this regard, and I don't want to make too many points that seem obvious, but there were some economic issues that I think need to be brought into light. Um, and I'd also like to highlight some spaces that have actually opened up, which I think also offer some promising possibilities, despite the very negative imprint of the administration on the global economy and on global economic governance. Um, one area that, I, that I'd like to raise or it focuses on the implications of the Trump administration for global financial stability and the role of the dollar as the world's currency. Uh, we can see the dollar as a kind of barometer of investor confidence in the U.S. economy and in its, uh, the central role of its currency um, in the world economy. As you probably know, right after the election in November, the dollar immediately strengthened because investors expected a new Republican administration to increase growth um, in increased spending, tax cuts, infrastructure spending, and so that agenda initially buoyed investor confidence and caused the dollar to kind of rally and um, appreciate right after the election. 
Um, that very quickly dissipated, and since the start of 2017, the dollar has been depreciating rather significantly as a reflection of the loss of confidence um, in the U.S., in its currency, and in its financial system. Um, in fact, since the start of 2017, the dollar has lost about 8% of its value against major currencies. Um, and the dollar lost 10% of its value in the administration's first 100 days. Um, there were also a few moments um, during the Trump administration when there were very significant episodes of capital flight. That is to say that investors sold dollars and so dollar-denominated de assets on a very large scale. Um, those became known as the Trump tantrums um, when investors experienced a rapid loss of confidence and exited the dollar and U.S. assets. That contributed to a further weakening of the dollar, something that continues up until the present time. And I'll note that if you are wondering where did all that capital go that left U.S. markets, it went largely to the financial markets of emerging markets and developing economies, which is both good and bad for them. And I'll return to that point um, in a moment. Now, the Treasury Department under the Trump administration has said very little about the value of the dollar, which is rather unique because one of the Treasury Department's sort of central mandates is to focus on the value and the role of the dollar in the world economy. We know that candidate Trump and now President Trump has made a few statements about the dollar, and to the extent that he's spoken in any coherent way about the dollar, he's indicated that he welcomes a weaker U.S. dollar, that is, a depreciating U.S. dollar, as a way of boosting U.S. exports. He seems to be getting his wish in that connection, um, of course. Um, and what's, I think, interesting to me as an economist about that is that the administration, the economists working for the administration don't appreciate in any sense what are the potential costs of the dollar's weakening for the U.S. economy. They're so fixated on the idea that a weaker dollar can boost U.S. exports that they fail to appreciate that the U.S. has a very large trade deficit. We import more than we export. And so as the dollar depreciates, imports become more expensive for the U.S. And so the balance of effects on the U.S. of a weaker dollar are more likely to be negative rather than positive. It's also the case that historically, um, a weaker dollar can create a kind of vicious cycle of continued downward momentum in the value of the currency, um, which could impact the role of the dollar in the years to come. And it's a very this um, this embrace of a weaker dollar by the Trump administration is a quite a unique position um, for a nationalist administration because nationalist leaders in the U.S. context and in the global context traditionally seek out stronger currencies, but we here we have a nationalist administration that seems fixated on the idea of a weaker currency. I think that reflects the overall kind of incoherence of the administration and its inability of even its economists to understand uh, the workings of the global economy. The flip side of the weaker dollar um, and of the administration's uh, talk about the dollar is what's been happening to the Chinese currency um, at the same time. The administration has also been preoccupied with the Chinese currency and Chinese currency practices, arguing repeatedly that China's policy toward the RMB, its currency, is unfair in some way and that China is a currency manipulator and is engaging in policies essentially designed to artificially bring about a depreciation of the Chinese currency in order to boost Chinese exports and employment. Um, what's notable about that uh, narrative is that it's completely wrong. Uh, China is actually boosting the value of its currency. It's been engaging in a practice for the last 18 months of actually trying to bring about an appreciation of the RMB rather than uh, bringing about a depreciation of the RMB. Um, and every time the Trump administration talks about branding China as a currency manipulator, its own Treasury Department has neglected to take note of the fact that the Treasury Department has a three-point criteria for a set of practices that are required to be met in order for a country to be labeled as a currency appreciator, significant sur uh, trade surplus with the US, a certain percentage of official reserves have to be expended in order uh, to intervene in the market for the currency, 
Um, and China, in fact, meets none of those three criteria. Uh, the countries that meet one of those three criteria are among the U.S.'s most important allies. Switzerland, Germany, and South Korea meet one of the three criteria, but the, the administration has not really acknowledged that. Um, so this very kind of perverse um, attitude about the dollar and the kind of um, revisionist history of the RNB, I think, is part of the landscape of increasing concern about global financial instability that's really been engendered uh, by the Trump administration. Another aspect of the global financial environment that's of concern to me is what's going on in the stock market. The stock market has been on a kind of tear uh, lately. There's clearly a kind of asset bubble going on in the U.S. stock market because of investors' overconfidence in the robustness of the U.S. recovery and the promises of lower corporate taxes, deregulation, um, an environment in which insider dealing and clientelism will continue to flourish under the Trump administration. And certainly, if the stock market bubble bursts, and it certainly will, all bubbles do burst, the only question is, when does that happen? Um, there is, of course, a question about whether we could expect the administration to have the capabilities and the capacity to intervene in ways to stabilize financial markets in the context of its stated commitment to market discipline and laissez-faire, uh, but we might also consider the fact that given that one of the central qualifying characteristics for being a member of the administration is having worked at Goldman Sachs for some time, that there will be some uh, need to try to stabilize financial markets because of the role that private financial actors play in this administration. Um, one other aspect of the environment of global financial risk that I see emerging as an outcome of the administration concerns what's happening at the U.S. Federal Reserve. Um, I'm sure everyone uh, took note of the announcement that the Federal Reserve made yesterday, which was a very considered, careful, and expected announcement, not likely in any way to shock financial markets. But what I think is much more worrisome when we look at the U.S. Federal Reserve is staffing issues. Um, Fed Chair Janet Yellen's term expires in February. Trump has been silent on the question of whether Yellen, who's immensely qualified for the position, will be reappointed, which at least suggests that she might not be. Her number two, Stanley Fisher, also a person of great competence, has announced his resignation ahead of schedule. Um, and there are also three other open seats on the Federal Reserve's main policymaking body. And so that raises the question of who will be appointed in these very critical policymaking capacities, uh, which have become even more important given the level of incompetence at the U.S. Treasury Department right now. So the question is, Will the people that are appointed to the number one, the number two, and then the other three open seats on the Federal Reserve have the technical competence to take on the challenges of steering the global financial system? Will they have the goal of actually undermining the performance and the mission um, of that institution, as has been the case, of course, with many Trump appointees to other agencies? And will they be prepared to take action if another financial crisis emerges nationally or even globally? And certainly there's some financial risks emerging when we think about the Chinese economy. At the present time, uh, we know that during the global financial crisis, the U.S. Federal Reserve was highly activist and was highly successful in at least containing um, some of the spillover effects of the global crisis by signing things like currency swap arrangements with other central banks engaging in emergency injections of liquidity to markets, working very closely with the central banks of G20 countries. Um, depending upon the Trump appointees to the Federal Reserve, it's not clear that any of those things will happen. Um, one other aspect of the global financial environment that I want to mention are, relates to the prospects of emerging markets and developing economies. As I mentioned earlier, that as capital has left U.S. markets, it has moved into emerging markets and developing economies. That happened earlier in the global financial crisis as well, from 2008 through 2012. There was also a wave of capital out of the U.S. into emerging markets and developing countries. That has started to happen again. That is in some sense is good for those economies because it provides more capital that can be used to finance investment and so can create employment and growth and improve living standards. Those are clear pluses. But on the downside, the inflows of capital cause developing economies' currencies to appreciate. 
Most developing countries are commodity exporters, so when their currencies appreciate, their commodity exports become more expensive, um, and that poses a real challenge for their economies. It's also the case that in the context of the low cost and abundant liquidity in the financial markets of advanced economies like the U.S., um, governments and firms in the developing world have taken on very high leverage ratios. They're high, they have very high levels of debt at this time. They have asset bubbles that are merging. That creates vulnerabilities, particularly if capital then is reverses course and comes back uh, to U.S. markets. The question is, what would happen if that occurs? Would emerging markets in developing countries return to the IMF or turn to the IMF for support in the context of a crisis? That's what usually happens. The U.S. has undue influence over the IMF's decision making because the U.S. is the largest single holder of voting shares at the IMF. Uh, the two people that President Trump has appointed to represent the U.S. to vote on the U.S.'s behalf, literally, at the IMF are both um, opposed to any assistance to countries in crisis. And indeed, they're much like those folks that have been appointed to lead the EPA and other agencies, which is to say they've spent most of their academic careers arguing that the IMF should be dismantled and shouldn't play the role of providing financial stability as a global public good. And so, of course, that matters a lot um, when we think about financial stability. Um, one other aspect of the developing world that I guess I would just want to mention quickly, the Sustainable Development Goals. The UN has put forth a very ambitious uh, development agenda embodied in the SDGs. The U.S. is clearly not going to play a role in facilitating the achievement of SDGs through uh, foreign aid. Um, and certainly events in Mexico and in Latin America suggest a greater need for foreign aid, which is certainly not likely to be forthcoming in any significant way um, from the U.S. Uh, but in terms of progress toward the SDGs, other countries have started to step in to fill the leadership void uh, that the U.S. has created. And so we have Chinese financial diplomacy, diplomacy by large Latin American countries. Uh, we have new kinds of networks of rising donors in the world. European countries are stepping up to some extent in the foreign aid arena to really try to fill the gap that would historically have been played at least to an important extent uh, by the U.S. Last point, global economic governance. Um, what we know is that the old Bretton Woods era post-World War II system of global economic governance is in flux at the present time. That was started to happen after the Asian financial crisis of the late 1990s, and that system was really transformed to a greater extent during the global financial crisis. Um, and those structures of global economic governance, I think, are evolving in important ways that leave the U.S. out by the U.S. government's own choice. And I'll note here that that choice seems to have been made initially by President Obama, who opted to stay on the sidelines of a lot of the Asian financial architectural innovations, like the creation of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which the U.S. refused to join, along with Japan, though all of our um, part, global partners did join that, and certainly President Trump has kind of taken that financial isolationism into sort of radically uh, new and important directions. The U.S. has also taken a very belligerent and unproductive stance at the other institutions of global economic governance, like the Group of 20 Nations, which replaced the G7 during the global crisis, at the Bretton Woods institutions, by which I mean the IMF and the World Bank, and the U.S. has also started to take a back seat at the Bank for International Settlements, the Financial Stability Board, the OECD, et cetera. I think we have good reason to expect that to continue. What I would note here, and sort of in my closing, is that these institutions seem somewhat unfazed by the U.S.'s withdrawal from these institutions and hostility, um, and they seem to be working around the U.S. Um, and European representatives to these institutions, working with mid-sized and large-sized developing countries, seem to be jumping into the leadership void um, in ways that I think really underscore the U.S.'s having stepped out of that role. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Nader for organizing today's event and thank all of you for coming and, and participating. And
my colleagues, Jack and Micheline and Eileen. Um, I gave my talk a title, Malign Neglect, uh, to refer to the way in which the US is now approaching Latin America. And I'm gonna focus my, uh, my, my 10 minutes on the way the, in which US democracy or practice or policy is shaping Latin American uh, democracy and, and the problems that it presents for Latin American democracy. And I'll make a few quick observations to begin. In Trump's UN speech yesterday, he mentioned two Latin American countries, Venezuela and Cuba. Uh, about Cuba, we will not lift sanctions on the Cuban government until it makes fundamental reforms. And about Venezuela, the U.S. has taken important steps to hold the regime accountable. We're prepared to take further action if the government of Venezuela persists on its path to impose authoritarian rule. Um, he began his campaign by referring to Mexicans. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists. Um, we're going to build the wall and they're going to pay for it. Two weeks ago, he rescinded DACA casting into doubt the situation of 800,000 800, young people who had, grant, who had been granted a, a reprieve of their immigration status uh, by an executive order, an Obama executive order. In Central America, uh, especially the Northern Triangle, uh, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, which is the source of much of the migration to the US at the current moment, Trump shifted US policy, collected under the Alliance for Prosperity, intensifying greater focus on investment in large-scale infrastructure and deregulation of economic rules to promote exports and promote uh, mining and extractive industries, greater aid to military and security forces, and less attention to rule of law and small-scale development. I could go on, but what's striking about all of these policy steps and statements is that, for me, they're gonna have exactly the opposite of their stated goals. In Cuba and Venezuela, this bellicose rhetoric and policy is not gonna topple the regime uh, in either country. Uh, in fact, it strengthens hardliners in both countries who tighten their hold on power. In Mexico, the, the idea of militarizing the border and demonizing immigrants is not gonna slow immigration. In fact, net immigration from Mexico is either flat or declining. Um, it just makes life more difficult for Latinos here in, in the US and encourages less, not more cooperation from Mexico. In Central America, the policy is strengthening exactly the forces the people are fleeing. Um, Infrastructure, monocropping, mining displaces poor people from the countryside. Deregulation causes insecurity and formality in work uh, for, uh, for people in, the, in, in cities. Uh, increased money into security forces turns up the volume and increases the violence involved with gangs and drugs and drives people from their neighborhoods. So why are we saying and doing exactly the opposite of what we might uh, 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 want to achieve? I don't think it's because Trump and the people around him are dumb. Maybe. But I think they know exactly what they're doing. That's the, that's the scary part for me. Um, they have a very narrow agenda, an agenda focused on extractivism, deregulation, and militarism. Um, and they'll ally themselves with non-democratic actors in Latin America if they need to. Um, <clears throat> The folks that they're listening to on Cuba and Venezuela, the hardliners in Miami, only have a voice in Cuba and Venezuela if those regimes collapse completely. They have no voice if moderates are negotiating solutions to the problems that operate on the ground. In Mexico and Central America, they don't care, the administration doesn't care about migration in the way that they're talking about. They want migrants to be more vulnerable. Migrants are gonna come, they want them to work for cheap, for low wages, and to be vulnerable to the state and to employers who can kick them out and bring them in as they wish. Uh, and in Central America and in the rest of Latin America, they don't really care about development. They care about extracting what they can from mines and commodities and low wage free trade zones. Um, and if, that if this agenda requires an alliance with the most retrograde and backwards oligarchic and military allies, then so be it. Um, I should emphasize that this is a shift in the character, though not entirely the substance of US policy towards Latin America for a long time, which is why I say that Trump represents ben, uh, malign neglect. Previous administrations, Obama, Bush, perhaps Clinton, we could talk about benign neglect. 
U.S. has not paid a whole lot of attention to Latin America, um, and now what we see is simply the emergence of a very focused, narrow agenda and its expression towards Latin America in this, in this way. Um, the scary thing about it, the uh, even more scary thing about it, is that there's resonance to this in Latin America. There are actors in Latin America, oligarchic interests, that have been there all along, that have played at politics for decades, centuries, who welcome this kind of engagement from the US. Um, they were somewhat moderated in the, in, the 2000, in the 1990s and the 2000s by a cosmopolitan elite, if you want to call it that, a middle class, and an organized and popular left that had united in turning back dictatorial regimes of the 60s and 70s. Starting in the 2000s or so, those oligarchic old guard elites started to realize that they could get away with the shenanigans that they always used to get away with. Um, the US would not go to the mat to defend those democratic alliances that had taken shape and started to form if pressed. So the first coup was in the 2000s in, in Venezuela, and the US backed it. Those, turned, those rolled back quickly. Uh, the next one came in Haiti, the U.S. backed it. Uh, the, the U.S. acquiesced to it, I should say. Uh, next came attempted coups in Bolivia, Ecuador, and again in Venezuela. The successful coup in Honduras. Uh, artful removals of presidents through quasi-democratic parliamentary mechanisms in Paraguay, in Brazil. Electoral victories for the right in Chile and in, in Argentina. All of these were handed to the US as fait accompli by those foxes, those oligarchs who have been playing at politics for generations in Latin America. And when the US neglects Latin American politics, as it generally does, they're there on the ground. And they've trained their sons and daughters to manipulate the rules of legislatures and elections and civil military relations, if necessary, in order to keep their hold on power. Um, so they know the ins and outs of what's going on in the, in, on the ground in Latin America. And when we, we neglect malign or benign, um, they hand us non-democratic outcomes that we end up accepting. Um, under Trump, it appears that we are accepting those non-democratic outcomes with pleasure because they advance that same extractivist, uh, uh, deregulated, and militarist approach to, to, uh, to the region. Um, <clears throat> I guess I want to, uh, to, to finish by reflecting a little bit about what the, the title of today's event or the, 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 the um, overall message of today's event is in which we sort of ask ourselves as international relations scholars, as a public uh, you know, what do we do in this moment in which practices in the US, undemocratic conditions in the US, are shaping undemocratic and, and backwards conditions uh, across the world? And, and I guess the, the only thing that there is to do is resist. So when, you know, in, in other moments, I've, I get invited, and many of my colleagues, I'm sure, also get invited, invited by US embassies to participate in projects around the world uh, presenting to local legislatures on tax policy, which is one of the things I study. So I go and give talks about this in, in Latin America. And in some countries, I'll accept those invitations, where I feel that the US embassy has a role, but isn't the heavyweight in the room when it comes to who are the, the, the actors on the ground that decide policy. And I think that a voice that's brought in by the US embassy can be a, a perfectly fine one. There are other countries in the region where I never accept that invitation. To go on the invitation of the US Embassy is to be the heavyweight in the room, and to be the heavy, and to impose what's going to eventually turn out to be policy. And so I don't accept those invitations. Under this administration, in which the neglect towards Latin America is malign, I don't accept any invitations to go talk on behalf of the US Embassy in Latin America. There's no way in which I can represent that voice in Latin America. And we see people resigning from the State Department and from other places. It's when we remove compliance with a regime that is attempting to impose an undemocratic and an anti-developmental agenda 
not just here, but uh, across the world, that that regime will be stopped. And so, you know, what is the message or what's the way in which we respond to our analysis and, and the way we act on this analysis of what's going on here and the way it influences the world is to resist. And my resistance is to remove compliance and say that we won't participate in helping this government do what it intends to do. Thanks. Okay, thank you to the panel. I've got actually a question for each of them, and then we're going to open it up to Q&A. So, Jack, what do we do? We have these structural problems with our democracy. It's almost impossible to um, uh, rewrite or reform the Electoral College given the constitutional provisions that are there. So are we simply stuck with this state of affairs without any hope for bringing about these changes in America's electoral system, which are deeply democratic for precisely the reasons that you... Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, one... One possibility. Oh, you, yes. oh, you can use the microphone. Yeah. Um, okay. Obviously, constitutional amendment isn't going to work. However, each state is responsible for its own. Each state is responsible for how it uh, goes about allocating its electoral votes, and there is a movement going on to have individual states. Uh, decide that they will cast their electoral votes on the basis of the national popular vote. Mm -hmm. If we get uh, 200 and whatever it is, 270, 70, um, we will be able to do that. So that's a work a work around mm -hmm. um, for uh, what's essentially the gerrymandering problem. Um, the solution is a partial solution, uh, but a, a pretty good solution is nonpartisan. Um, districting commissions, which exist in six states already. Um, and in four of them, it's largely removed the problem. The other two, it hasn't because of the, uh, the fact they're small states, Montana and some other place. Uh, uh, but that's a mechanism around it. And obviously, the voter, uh, voter suppression stuff is all subject to, to action. So yes, there's structural problems. We're never going to get around the Senate. Right. All right. And honestly, I don't have any real problem with with every state having two votes in the Senate. There's something, I, I can deal with that um, in a way. If we got a president by popular vote, um, and if we fix the gerrymandering problem um, at the uh, House of Representatives level, ideally at the state level as well, but we're talking the national level, then maybe we can say it's a historical legacy and rec representing some part of that historical legacy is perfectly acceptable, especially since there's no alternative, but the other two can be done and and might be done. The problem, of course, is that those who benefit from it um, are not likely to support it. Right, great. Okay, so, so Micheline, um, in your discussion of sort of right-wing populism, I'm wondering if you had any thoughts on how specifically the U.S. case is distinct from other cases of right-wing populism, because much of what you described applies to all of these cases of right-wing populist um, movements. They're all reading from the Machiavellian playbook. They're all instoking fear. They're all feeding off of the um, perceived illegitimacy of existing political institutions. Um, so at one level, they're all common, but I'm wondering if you could identify in what way right-wing populism here in the United States has distinct and unique characteristics that are different from what we're seeing in other parts of the world, Europe, India, or is this basically the same story everywhere with, with very little substantive difference? Um, no, it's a good question. Uh, there are distinctive differences, and it, it's rely upon the distinctions upon civil societies and the robustness of our institutions. So if you compare India and the type of populism that emerged in India versus the United States or even Hungary, the United States have so much more stronger mm -hmm. and robust system the Supreme Court and other the court has been actually quite activist against some of the mm -hmm. uh, order of uh, Trump, and we know that uh, it's sort of the Trump administration has been quite handcuffed in many of its effort to um, create a policy of deportations uh, against immigrants. So to this, to this, uh, to go back to the structural analysis, I would certainly suggest that yes, indeed, the United States is a much more robust democracy, making it a little bit more difficult. But you know, we know that history tells us that there is a possibility for those institutions to erode, and we have to be very careful they don't happen. I would like to add to what Jack has suggested that even if we were able 
to make those changes, electoral changes, the changes with respect to the electoral college or the change in gerrymandering, we still have only 40% of the populations that voted in the past <coughs> election. And what does it tell us? It does tell us that people don't care. And the question is, why do they don't care? It's because they feel that nobody really represents them. And so the real root cause of the question still have to be addressed if we were to push those changes that Jack was referring to initially. So how do we get people just energized and interested and wanting to be part of the social contract of what make America great is really the question that we have not posed, certainly not in the Democratic Party. We need much stronger uh, economic coalitions that brings together those different groups of the rainbow coalitions um, and actually creates sort of an agenda that makes more sense and in more integrated with the rest of the international world. So I'm, I'm sort of deviating at the last point of, from your question. Great. Um, Eileen, you began your remarks by saying that there were these sort of positive spaces that were opening up. And I'm not sure if you were speaking to that point at the end when you talked about the evolving global uh, um, economic governance in institutions. Was that what you were referring to? And if it was, could you say a bit more about how exactly that's positive uh, for the particular you know, crisis that we're facing today? Yeah, I think um, it's a good, a good way of framing it, Nader. Um, I, what's, what's happening in terms of global economic governance and particularly in the financial arena is that it is being reshaped in really important ways, again, ways which keep the US on the sidelines by the government's own choice um, at this point. What's happening is this is a time of tremendous innovation in economic governance institutions. There's a new financial landscape that's emerging um, where there are institutions that are at this point complementary to the post-World War II Bretton Woods institutions of the IMF and the World Bank, but which are coming to play a really important role in providing long-term finance, which is the traditional job of the World Bank, and institutions that provide crisis support, which is the traditional role played by the International Monetary Fund. Um, there are crisis support institutions that have come to play a much more active role during the global crisis. Um, a couple of them that I'd mentioned, there's the institution called the Latin American Reserve Fund, the existence of which predates the global financial crisis, but it expanded its capacities, its capital, and its mission, and became quite activism activist in terms of providing crisis support finance to countries in Latin America during the global crisis, uh, the Arab Monetary Fund, an institution which has no relationship to the International Monetary Fund, provided crisis support finance to countries in North Africa and the Arab world. Um, there are institutions in the Eurasian economic community, including one called the um, Eurasian Financial Stability and Development Fund, which provided capital to countries like Belarus and other former Soviet bloc countries. Um, and so these represent and kind of alternative mechanisms for delivering crisis support, which really became much more important during the financial crisis, uh, which made the IMF a much less important institution aside from the European context. The same is true, and perhaps even more dramatically, when we look at long-term uh, finance, uh, loans for things like infrastructure projects. China, of course, is intensely interested in infrastructure. It created the AAIB during the crisis, which is the world's largest development finance institution. It sits alongside the China Development Bank, the China Export Import Bank, and 13 other new funds that China has created to finance infrastructure across the world, the biggest of which is called the Silk Road Fund. So there's a variety of Chinese led financial diplomatic efforts that I think also um, help to make the World Bank a much less important institution alongside that because it's not just a story about China. There are institutions in Latin America like the Development Bank of Latin America, which has become much more important, the Eurasian Development Bank, the Islamic Development Bank. All of these banks have become much more involved in playing roles that were formerly played by the traditional post-World War II financial institutions. 
It's also the case that other aspects of the global financial architecture, like the Group of Seven, evolved during the global crisis to provide some developing countries with a seat at the table. Um, the G7 became the G20 during the global crisis. The Financial Stability Forum became the Financial Stability Board, and for the first time in its history also gave seats onto the body uh, to developing countries. And so there are lots and lots of ways in which institutions of global economic governance have been evolving at the same time as the U.S., particularly under Trump, but I'd say beginning under President Obama, began to withdraw from its traditional global economic roles. And certainly the WTO's future is also um, a bit uncertain at the present time. Uh, Trump has spoken many times about wanting to unravel various agreements that the U.S. has negotiated through the WTO, leaving us to wonder what those renegotiate agreements will look like, NAFTA being, of course, one such agreement on a much smaller scale. But in that sense, the trade architecture is also now, I think, the site of tremendous aperture. Great. Um, so Aaron, Latin America, if the shift between Obama and Trump is a change in policy, U.S. policy from uh, what you said, benign uh, neglect to malign neglect, at the end of the day, it's still neglect. And it raises questions to what extent the U.S. US policy or whoever is occupying the White House actually matters in terms of shaping the fundamental possibilities of political and economic development in Latin America. I mean, one of, the one of the interpretations from what you said is that it really doesn't matter. Yes, some oligarchies and right-wing populist forces are encouraged by Trump, but if it's neglect at the end of the day, to what extent does it matter? Could you speak to that point? Sure. Um, I think that the answer is that we're still waiting for the right president. Um, he, there hasn't yet been a president that has truly been positive for development and democracy in Latin America, yeah. ever. Has so, Bernie Sanders <laughs> said anything on the topic? Uh, uh, not not enough to to indicate that he wouldn't continue with neglect right um and so you know i, I think it, it's a it's an open question you know what would u.s policy towards latin america or the president that that introduces u.s policy towards latin america that truly promotes development and democracy what would it look like and yeah we're we are still waiting um, it, I don't think neglect would be part of it. You know, I think that there has to be engagement within the hemisphere, and there are there are shared problems that we face: um, the environment, uh, the, the movement of people, instability of financial and and productive uh, uh, markets. These these problems are hemispheric, if not global. And so there are not unilateral or just national solutions to these problems. So there needs to be a US Latin America engagement, one that is not neglectful, um, but yet the, the forms of engagement that we've seen so far have oftentimes made not, these, not just these problems, but other problems worse and, and not better. Okay. Okay, the floor is open. We have a, uh, a little bit of time for questions from the floor. We're going to try and wrap up roughly around 1.30, since many of us have to go to classes at 2 o'clock. So the standard rules apply, you know, a question, not a speech. Keep it succinct. If you're going to direct it to one member of the panel, mention their name, and as a courtesy, um, other members uh, of the panel have the right to, to respond. So I'm not sure if that microphone is actually on, but the first person who approaches it, be sure to flick on the on switch so we can all hear what you're saying. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> test, test. Yep. Um, so on the finishing note, we're talking about uh, the development of democracies in Latin America. I would like to uh, see what, what you all would have to say from um, the point of view of, of Trump's acceptance of uh, the liberal democratic leaders and uh, bringing Duterte from the Philippines uh, being a little friendly with Recep Tayyip Erdogan from Turkey right now, having El Sisi come to the White House, um, and the implications that that has for U.S. global leadership and the future of, of uh, U.S. global leadership, if that trend continues. Aaron, you want to take that? And, and I think that it, it sort of echoes the observation that Trump and the folks around him are perfectly happy to, to receive these types of leaders if they're advancing the other agendas of, of, of the administration. Um, and so it is a signal when he receives you know, Duterte and others 
that sends a signal to other potential illiberal actors around around the world that you know as long as you cooperate with the US on the stuff that the US thinks is important in your country in your region then you can get away with pretty much anything you want as far as uh, degrading the democracy in your countries I think it I think it's very dangerous let me push you a little bit on that Aaron um, Obama um, was very comfortable with LCC after the coup maybe not as open but the relationship was there the aid didn't 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 wasn't substantively you know reduced with the Saudis you know, Obama was very close with the Saudis. They didn't like him because he wasn't endorsing him, but the, the, the arms still flowed. I'm just wondering to what extent it actually matters, you know, whether we have a president who's openly, you know, embracing and praising these authoritarian despots or whether it's a more subtle and a bit more measured. I don't see, at least in terms of the Middle East as far as I know, um, a major substantive difference in terms of what happens internally in those countries and to what extent those countries um, are actually affected by what the President of the United States happened to be saying. Mm. Now, maybe that's just my cynicism mm. at work here. What do you, what do you think? I, I, I think I agree with you in the sense that this is, you know, a the difference between, like I said, malign neglect versus benign neglect or, or the notion that the U.S. isn't the determinant of these outcomes. And you know we have decades, if not centuries, of supporting these types of actors in in other countries, especially in Latin America. Mm -hmm. And so you're right; it's not that Trump is the first president to embrace a illiberal, you know, leader around the world. And, and uh, um, we we should be holding all of our presidents to account, and not just this one. And we should hold this one. Okay, Micheline, you want to add, and then we'll go to the next question. I will make a distinction between tactical alliance and ideological alliance. So perhaps under the Obama, you had the alliance with Saudi Arabia and uh, with Turkey and with Al Sisi at the very early, um, uh, the beginning when uh, Al Sisi took power. But but what this president is doing is truly to focus on a major front assault against the international liberal order, which needed to be fixed for sure. But that's what he's doing, and he's not trying to replace it with another liberal international order, mm -hmm. even in a better version of it. And so the type of individuals that he has courted, right from the outset, since the beginning of his elections, whether it's Erdogan or Al-Sisi, the first phone call, phone call to, to the White House, has been very, very clear that the populist leaders of the world unite under the condition, and only insofar as you are not going to encroach against each other. But it is also the idea is that we are going to have to do and take care of our own, and we are not going to do it by just simply ratify international treaty. And I think that in that sense, it's a, very, it's a distinct mm -hmm. difference from the Obama administration. Jack? I mean, I'm surprised. I mean, so I would say you look at Yemen, you look at the Iran deal, you look at the kinds of responses to Turkey. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say that the Middle East is the one area where you can see a clearly uh, dramatic impact of what Trump is doing. Um, the Saudis were going to stay involved in Yemen, but certainly the Obama administration was putting some pressure on them. Well, that's to, debatable. Uh, okay, uh, mm -hmm. let's take the Iran deal. Yeah. Okay, uh, yes, on the Iran deal, let's take, let's take the Iran yeah. deal. Uh, let's take the nature of the response to what, what's going on in Turkey. Um, it seems to me clear that, that malign neglect is worse than, than relatively benign neglect mm -hmm. and that, uh, that this matters in terms of the general perception of a democratic country. Mm -hmm. uh, pursuing democratic values. It's a difference between pursuing democratic values and making well-judged or poorly judged trade-offs um, in many of the cases. But when you're not even making trade-offs, right. when you're not even saying that this doesn't matter, I mean, you know, whatever you might think about Syria um, in terms of the actual policy, I mean, the idea that we don't care whether or not Assad continues to rule makes a difference. Right. Um, and that these kinds of things are important for, in, in, it seems to me, in, in the medium and long run mm -hmm. and in terms of, of the global prospects. I mean, uh, I think, I found your examples kind of odd, um, actually. I don't see what's so great about uh, having a fund that bails Belarus out. Um, I don't understand why the Chinese are a much better source uh, for supporting democracy uh, if you get long-run funding from China than if you get it from the bank 
for the fund, it seems to me that the United States certainly screws up more than a chair, and maybe the world would be better off without any American foreign policy. But we can certainly point to a, a number of places, and it seems to me that uh, for all their problems, the, the bank and the fund um, are no worse and arguably better for democracy than getting your money from China. Um, and it seems to me that, that, that we should not just because the U.S. is not as involved, because the IMF isn't as involved, that doesn't mean that the prospects for democracy have improved um, when you replace uh, the World Bank with China. It seems to me that that doesn't make any sense at all to me in terms of what we're interested in, in terms of a global architecture that supports democracy and human rights. Eileen, you respond to anything that's sure. has been sure. put on the table. <laughs> Um, comments as well. Um, I think other, other reasons why um, Trump's embrace of strongman leaders around the world is important is that it helps to normalize not just him, but also normalize this whole idea of these strongman leaders who are also supporting one another. And we think about the way that they're facilitating, whether it's intervention in the U.S. elections by by the Russians, there is a kind of architecture of these strong men, uh, which makes each one of them stronger um, than they would be alone. So I think it matters um, on that side. Um, on the other side of the equation, the only benefit, and here I would struggle to find one, of this network of strong men, leaders around the world, is that it may be creating closer ties between liberal leaders around the world. If we think about the way like the Franco-German alliance seems to have been strengthened and the way Trudeau um, has become a much more important figure of the new Irish prime minister, that we've got this new kind of epistemic community of liberal, relatively young leaders um, that seem to be pushed together, perhaps in this context of a really illiberal world order, that I think matters and it's caused some of them to redouble commitments to things like fighting climate change or committing resources to the SDGs, cooperating with one another in different ways, to thinking about creating a G20 minus one, that is minus the US or where the US <laughs> sits on the sidelines. And so that may be to the extent that there's a small silver lining, I think that that's something that I'd, I'd like to think about more. In terms of Jack's question, it's an, it's an important one. Um, and I don't want to be misunderstood here. Um, what's not happening is that the Bretton Woods institutions are going away. I would not, I hope I didn't sound like I was arguing that, that those institutions are disappearing. I think what's happening, and something I've been arguing in recent research, is that a more pluripolar financial system and global economic architecture is what's emerging where the U.S. It sits alongside many other form alternative governance arrangements and institutions, some of which are complementary to the old order, the Bretton Woods institutions, some of which are in competition with them. But I think the, the architecture itself is becoming much more multinodal um, and more complex, and I think that that's a good thing. The reason why I think that's a good thing is that it offers developing countries the opportunity to engage in form shopping. That is to say, it puts institutions in competition with one another so that crisis support and long-term finance may be offered to developing countries on better, more attractive terms. That is at lower interest rates, that is less pro-cyclical, and is less constraining of policy autonomy then has been the case when there's been only one game in town, which is the Bretton Woods order. And indeed, there is very strong evidence that that is the case, that the competition between the old institutions of the IMF and the, and the World Bank and the newer institutions has proven to be very beneficial and that many be developing country policymakers have been able over the last eight to 10 years to be able to play these institutions off one another and actually receive support on terms which are much more advantageous to them and more autonomy promoting. And so in that sense, I think competitive pluralism in the global financial system is actually a very good thing. Um, China's loans to the developing world are something that, of course, people in the development community talk a lot about. There are some controversial aspects of those loans, to be sure. Many of them, are, of course, tied to resource extraction. But it's also the case that those loans 
have also provided much needed infrastructure finance, finance that has not been provided by the Bretton Woods institutions over the last 30 years. They've turned away from long-term finance. There is a massive infrastructure financing gap um, in the global economy, and particularly in the developing world at this time. And the Bretton Woods institutions have been disinterested in me responding to that challenge, and it's actually been the institutions based in the developing world that have been heavily involved in responding to that challenge. If that forces the Bretton Woods institutions to step into that void, that would be a very good thing. It hasn't happened yet, despite all of the rhetoric about infrastructure finance. There's been very little new infrastructure lending that's come from the Bretton Woods Institution. So I think the new architecture actually does matter a lot, and it's been necessitated uh, by the inadequacies of the existing global financial architecture. Great. OK, I see three people lined up and so that we can finish on time. Ahmed, you're the third person. Can you raise your hand and know, so that everyone knows not to line up behind you? Great. And, let's, if we, and the questions can be as succinct and concise as possible. And I'll ask the panelists to be as, um, as concise as possible so we can finish on time. Go ahead. This is a super easy, straightforward. Could you speak into the microphone so people can hear this you? This is a super easy, straightforward question. Uh, Eric Holder, our former Attorney General, is reportedly focusing on some of these structural issues like gerrymandering. And I'm wondering if you know what approach his organization is taking uh, in terms of how to do that. No. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. <laughs> Actually, kind of on the same topic. Uh, looking at the structural issues, such as how seats are apportioned with the House of Representatives and kind of the outperforming of one party versus the other in regards to popular vote versus actual political assignment. And how could we start looking at ways to convince <coughs> some of those states who many people probably feel they only receive representation because of how those systems are designed? And coming from rural states, I know a lot of them think the cities will determine everything if they lose any of the the gerrymandering that's there and such. So how can we try to convince those states? That it's in their own people? interest to, yeah. to, to, to make these changes. Uh, I, it seems to me that if what you're interested in is protecting privileged groups um, and saying that just because you happen to live in a rural area, you're entitled to political privilege, I'm not going to be able to convince you um, I think that what we simply have to say is that we're committed to a system in which one vote counts for one vote. Um, and it doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter. Uh, it just doesn't matter. That's no more relevant than your race. And if we're committed to that, we ought to be committed to that. Now, if we want to engage in policies that benefit people who live in particular areas, we're certainly a reasonable thing to do. Uh, so if it costs you more to get health care because you live in rural areas, I think it's a wonderful thing that we do that so that people are treated equally. But the idea that simply where you live depends uh, should determine how much your vote counts seems to me to be fundamentally un-American. And until we, well, maybe, no, it's fundamentally American. It's fundamentally undemocratic. Uh, all right, I mean, uh, and, and that's the problem, right? Um, and that, that unless we're going to embrace that idea, um, it's not going to change. I mean, Montana went to nonpartisan redistricting. All right, that's pretty good. Montana and California both do it in the same way. I, I, it seems to me that when you think about the underlying idea, one vote counts for one vote, and residence is no more relevant than race or religion um, or any other thing, it ought to be something that we sell on those terms rather than trying to convince people um, to give up an unfair advantage um, by lying to them and telling them it's not an unfair advantage. It is an unfair advantage, and these unfair advantages ought to be attacked like other unfair advantages. Can I have yeah, go ahead. Just briefly, I'd like to add to the fact that we are unfortunately just a two-party system in this, in this country, and uh, many people don't think that's representative. Along the line of what Jack is suggesting, I think that one one thing that we could consider is perhaps also 
a change of the electoral system, which would perhaps, just like the French, provide us with two ballot system in which the first ballot would uh, provide um, uh, people to know that their voices is recognized and their preference is recognized. And the second ballot will be one in which will converge to one uh, individual, to two individual ultimately to a presidential candidate. We saw in the cases of France, we, had, it, had it been not only one vote, one ballot, we would have the potential chance of having Marie Le Pen or Ma Mélenchon. But the result of the second ballot provided us with the opportunity to have a different candidate and the electorate was able to actually register its vote with the new uh, 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 candidate that they vote for. So I think that this is the type of conversations that are very important because we are not having enough of the plurality of voices that are important in this particular in our democracy. Okay, last question. Uh, very briefly to Micheline. Um, now, nowadays, there is much talk in the Middle East of uh, a new horizon for peace in the, in the Middle East, given the very good relations between President Trump and uh, rulers of Egypt, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and so on. And in, what's your take on that? What is the possibility or likelihood of President Trump bringing a concrete, successful, long-lasting peace process in the Middle East? Uh, the the uh, quick answer to the first question is none. Uh, the second part of the question could be <laughs> that there is an opportunity that he will not take into consideration because for the first time, what we have seen as a result of the Arab winter rather than the Arab spring, uh, stronger co um, security cooperations between Israel, Jordan, and, um, and Egypt. And, and if it, it would not take such a great leap of imaginations to actually see when you develop that level of security trust, if we could translate it, convert it into economic cooperations, trans-regional economic cooperations between Israel, Jordan, and Egypt. I think that there will be a lot of space for many infrastructural economic development ideas. That's my writing, I'm sure you know about that, but if this is going to happen, Right now, I don't see that the climate shows that we are moving toward that direction, although there are opportunities that could lead um, in, in, in this more hopeful path toward this more hopeful. Okay, um, thank you everyone for your participation in this event, particularly the panel and to the questions from the floor. We're gonna be doing many more of these types of events given the fact that this topic is not going away anytime soon.